Candy Kiss is here. <laughs> and I've got seven of them. Now, I would have gotten a bag of Candy Kisses and given everybody one, but I know some of you don't need it. <laughs> and others shouldn't do it. And so as a result, I'm just going to leave them right here. And uh, <clears throat> if something in the... If something in that what I say today, which today's message I believe would be a shotgun message, y'all know what, what that one is. It's something that scatters and hits a lot of subjects. If one of the subjects hits you between the eyes, you're free to come up here and get one of these. <laughs> first come, first serve. Wait, kisses. How many of you like to kiss? Oh, I do too. I do. I, I like those six second kisses. Y'all, that's just when you put your lips together with your husband or your wife and you just kiss for at least six seconds. Sometimes mine goes as much as seven and eight <laughs> seconds. <clears throat> the kisses. Our culture is, is just inundated with, with talking about kisses. Kisses, love, love, <clears throat> love stories, uh, you know, radio, uh, songs talk about kisses. Teenagers got it in their mind, that first kiss, and uh, uh, the Hallmark movies. How, how many of you watch those Hallmark movies? I do. I think we've watched about every one of them, except for the new ones. And, and uh, inevitably, in the middle of the story, they start to kiss. And what happens? Telephone rings, doorknob, or somebody comes into the room. And what do they do? Stop. I told my wife, I said, there ain't nothing going to stop me once I'm on my way. <laughs> Unless you turn your head. <laughs> Those actors are crazy, or the writers are, are nuts. But kisses, kisses are expressions of love and affection. And, and in the Bible, I want you to know there are seven areas where kisses are mentioned. Did you know there are kisses in the Bible? There is. And two of them are not so good, but five of them are great. And the kisses, if you would put, put the, uh, the first one up there. Kisses in the Bible. There is the friendly kiss of hypocrisy. The friendly kiss of hypocrisy. In Luke 22, verse 47, while Jesus was speaking to the multitude, here comes Judas, one of the twelve, who went before the multitude, and he kissed Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Without a doubt, this is probably one of the most despicable portions of Scripture there is in the whole Bible. Even worse, Judas was actually trying to cover up his plot. He was thinking, maybe I can kiss Jesus, and he just said, well, I, I love you too, Jesus, Judas, and all of a sudden, here comes the mob. But Jesus knows everything. He knows the intents of our heart. He knows everything about us. Uh, yesterday, I felt, I, I felt so guilty. I had explained it over and over again, and I apologized profusely uh, because I heard a... Uh, I heard a we were talking about how the, the beheading of John the Baptist. And I thought, that is a, that's a stupid portion of Scripture. And I stopped right quick and I said, no, 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 no. I don't mean stupid Scripture, but the man is stupid who promised the head of John the Baptist. That was stupid. That was a stupid promise to make. But because I've said something like that, it just... I felt like I had betrayed Jesus. I had felt like I just... Uh, and, and, and the Holy Spirit says, Tim, 
He understands your motive. He knows what you're trying to say. And I say, thank you, God. Aren't you glad God knows the intent of our heart? Proverbs 27 says, the faithful wounds of a friend. Those are faithful. But the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Have you ever been betrayed by anybody? Mm. Somebody you love and, and uh, uh, friends that you've had for a long time and, and it, then you find out they talk against you behind your back? Or maybe you, you've, you've employed somebody to do something and, and you find out they're stealing from you? Husband, wife, cheat on you? That's betrayal to the highest extent. But nobody, ha no one has been betrayed like Jesus. Jesus, one of his precious 12, whom he knew was, was a devil, but he chose him because this was the will of God. Then there is the foolish kiss of idolatry. Idol worship. The foolish kiss of idolatry. In Hosea 13, Verse 2, they continue to sin, making their silver idols, images shaped skillfully by human hands. Sacrifice to these. They said, kiss the calf. Kiss the calf. By the time Hosea came on the scene, Israel had gotten pretty skilled in making different idols. Idols made of wood, made of silver, made of gold. And then they had not only the idols where they gathered as a worship place, but they also had little miniature idols. You know, like some people have the cross hanging around their neck. They had little miniature idols that they carry around their neck, or maybe they were carrying in their pocket, so that periodically they could pull that out and they could kiss allegiance to an idol. Idols. Well, we, we say, well, thank God I'm, I'm not an idol worshiper. But are we? You know, a lot of people worship money. Money is an idol. Set that money up. Uh, hang that money on the wall. Idol worship. Uh, and I never, I very seldom ever look at these billboards that say $91 million for the lottery. I, I, don't, I don't like to look at them. I don't see them. Uh, and I don't dream about them. Because there's a book that calls Money for Nothing. Money for Nothing. It says in that book that 70% of the people that win the lottery within seven years are broke. Or within seven years die because. Or have suffering in their family. They said you would be absolutely surprised at the amount of people that said, I wish I had never won the lottery. I wish I had never seen that money. Because it absolutely has devastated their life. And I know some people say, yes, but I'd like for it to give it a chance. I'd, I'd, I'd like to give it a shot <laughs> and see how well I could do. In this book, it says... <coughs> Only a few live happily ever after. Only a few. So therefore, money is not the answer to your, to your great need. Money is not your God. You say, well, that's money. That's not me. Well, all right. What about sports? All I have heard in the last two weeks, wherever you go or whatever you see, is the game, the game, the game. I'm, I'm so glad nobody asked me who's playing because I didn't know. Because I don't keep up with it. Sports is just not my thing. I, I, can, I can really take it or leave it and mostly leave it. Uh, but there's some people, I've been in some pastor's homes to where they can't wait for the service to get over so they can go and see the game. I'd say it's, a, it's the same game as you saw last week, maybe a different score or a different winner. Yeah, but I got to see it got to see those games. Uh, <clears throat> I was doing a revival meeting. I uh, used to do a revival meeting uh, about every year in this church. And the song leader would get up and lead songs. Yay! And then, after the song service, might, might even be a short song service, you'd look around and he was gone. 
And I'd say, Where, where's the song leader I need for him to play during the altar work? Oh, he went home. I said, why? Well, he likes to watch the sports. And game comes on every Sunday night. And he, he got to get home in time to see it. I thought, man, I cannot sacrifice a moment of being with that game. I'd rather be with the game than to be with God's people and worship in the Lord. To me, that's idol worship. So people worship sports. Uh, then there's entertainment. It's the entertainment world we're living in. And Las Vegas would go broke if it weren't for the entertainment that people have. Uh, and of course, we could go into all kinds of different habits and different things that we make gods. Can't live without. And we kiss those gods. And that's what captures our heart. Whatever captures our heart is our idol. And I have to really be careful about my, myself. I have to be careful about anything that I like a lot. And withdraw and say, nope, God's always got to be number one. He's got to always be number one. Lord, please check me if that ever, if anything ever tries to push you off the throne of my life. Please check me, Lord. Well, and then there is the figurative kiss of God's attributes. Now, this, this one I'm going to have to think about just a little bit. Because you look in Psalms 85, verse 10, it says, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, the attribute of God. We know that God is perfect. His truth is just. He is a just God. Demands righteousness. No one is able to be righteous enough to stand before Almighty God. We're all sinners, saved by grace, which happens to come with mercy. How can one person be just and rigid and yet be merciful? And yet that's the attribute of God. Mercy and truth have kissed. Aren't we glad they are Amen. joined together? That's the attribute of God. How it can happen, it's just hard to, 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 to realize. But in Romans, it says, Therefore, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that truth and mercy kissed on Calvary. That's when God said, now my mercy can truly be given because I'm not seeing the righteousness of men, but I am seeing the holiness of my son, Jesus. Then there's the faithful kiss of salvation. In Luke chapter 7, 37 and 38. Behold, a woman in the city came to Jesus and stood behind him. She was a sinner. And as she stood behind him, weeping, she knelt down and began to wash his feet. Her tears fell upon the feet and she wiped the feet. She kissed his feet and then anointed them with the ointment. Oh, what a beautiful picture of worship. An open expression of love. An open expression of love. She wasn't ashamed. She wasn't afraid. She wasn't bashful. She was very open and didn't care what anybody else thought. I am kissing the feet of Jesus. An open expression. Open expressions to me are hugging one another. That's an open expression. I, I, uh, my parents, uh, when I was growing up, and I don't know how it was in your home. Uh, some of you maybe didn't even have parents. I don't know. But in being raised in my home, I was, I was taught to hug. Give me a hug. 
and and you just hug and uh, kiss the cheek and I, I I just grew up that way it was just commonplace I remember though as a teenager because when you know sometimes you get to be a teenager uh, uh, you see it betrayed on movies. Well, no more hugging, son. Shake hands. I thought, hmm, I don't like that. But I was a teenager. I was about 15 years of age, and some boys came to the house and said, we're going over so-and-so, Would you? can you come? And I looked at my parents, and I said, they said, yeah, go ahead. And I hugged them. Mom and Dad and I was walking and I, back towards the door where they were standing and they saw me. And I saw them go. And I thought, I could be embarrassed. I could throw forth an explanation. But I don't care what they think. Because I'll be 30 years of age and I'll still hug my parents. When they turn 90 years of age. I was still hugging my parents. I say, hug them while you can. So the open expression of love is there. Uh, uh, and also, concerning Jesus, I was working with some men. Macho men. And they were making discussions among themselves about the various things. And I put my two cents worth in and I said and Jesus said and I saw their faces when I, the moment I said Jesus they went as if you ain't got nothing to say to us that's a value because you're still a baby because you're still talking about that man Jesus I didn't let that stop me I went louder. <laughs> I made sure they heard what I had to say. And the reason I had to say it, and finally I got their respect. They realized the name of Jesus is not something to be shied away about. But the name of Jesus is to be exalted, spoken with boldness, assurity, confidence. And that to me is an open expression of love to him. When I use his name publicly, unashamedly, that is hugging Jesus. That's kissing the cheek of Jesus or his feet. Then there is the farewell kiss. In Acts chapter 20, Paul was leaving to go to Rome. And the Ephesians knew that this was going to be the last time they saw Paul. And the Bible says they wept sore, which means they wept so much they had no more tears. And they fell upon his neck and they kissed him. They all kissed Paul a farewell, goodbye. You know, it's hard to give a farewell kiss to your loved one. Realizing this may be the last time you kiss them. You know, when, uh, when you're with your family and you, you hug them on a, uh, and, and you're going to go on a trip, you know, you think a lot about that, that hug. You think a lot about that kiss because you realize this might be the last kiss I ever give them. This might be the last kiss I ever receive from them. It could be that farewell kiss. We never know when we're going to have to say goodbye to a loved one. But it, but it happens. I'm, I'm in many funerals, and, and I see the farewell kiss that many of them give as they bend down over the coffin and they kiss the corpse of their, their loved one. Because a farewell kiss... Uh, it's hard to all oh, any time. It's hard to, to say goodbye. Missionaries, when they go on to a, their, their missionary countries, many times they go for five years without coming back on sabbatical. Five years. In five years' time, so much can happen within your family. And you're thousands and thousands of miles away, realizing that when you left, 
you gave them that farewell kiss. So love your loved ones while you can. Love each other while you can. And then there is the family kiss of the brethren. <clears throat> Paul says, in fact, the word says it in five different places. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Paul repeated that many times. He admonished his, the brethren to greet one another like that, wholeheartedly. In today's society, that's pretty risky business. In today's society, it's hard for two men to walk down the street or the mall or what have you together because of the thoughts of some of the people in society and why certain people in society have messed up relationships. Uh, Scott, stand up just a minute. I remember when I was a teenager, come on up close to me. Uh, when, when I was a teenager, I remember walking up the street. My cousin Doug, sometimes he comes here and worships with us. But I remember, put your arm around me. We'd go up the, we'd go up the, the road just, just like this. We were buddies. We were buddies. No one, thank you, Scott. No one ever thought anything about that. That, that was, that was an embrace. That was a brethren, a holy kiss, you might say. You can't do that today. You just society will not accept that. So, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, <clears throat> a lot of times today we would say it would be a hearty, heartfelt handshake. And or there is, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to see this, even in the business world, people not seeing each other for a while, they hug, men hugging each other. Women, it, 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 women can get away with just about anything. <laughs> they, they're, just, they just, they're just loving people, you know, just... They, people don't think too much about that as much as they do with men. But men, what do we do? Well, I still believe in the fact that yes, we can hug. There is a, a reverent, there is a kind of hug that is wholesome, that is saying, this is, I care about you. Then there is, I have had, I've had a few men who have come up to me, I even hear, that have kissed me on the cheek. Think nothing about that. It's, it's, it's an affection. Affection. It's saying, I really, I really appreciate you. I love you. And so you think nothing about that. So when you say, greet the brethren with a holy kiss, Paul was saying, love one another unashamedly. Love one another wholesomely. For one thing's for sure, the demand for Christian love has never been outdated and never will be. And then the last one is the forgiving kiss of compassion. Here's the most blessed scripture. Here's one of the most blessed portions of scripture that you'll read in Luke chapter 15. For the prodigal son, remember how he had left home, spent everything he had? squandered his money, had nothing to show for it, except pig slop all over him. And he came home and he was thinking, what, what's my dad going to say about this? I mean, I want to come home, but I don't feel like I can because of what I've been through. And I've got nothing to change this stuff out of. What am I going to do? And so he's on his way home rehearsing what he's going to say. I've sinned against heaven and, and, and I've sinned against you and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your servants. And he just over and over again. But the Bible says, I like this portion he said in verse 20. He arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Amen. The son 
couldn't hardly contain it because even the son couldn't accept himself. He backed away and started his speech. But the father said, no, no, this my son was dead. He's alive again. Let's rejoice. Which is a picture of our heavenly father. Kind of brings tears to my eyes a little bit of, of joy and gratefulness and humility to realize that when I came running to Jesus, I didn't have to worry about him saying, oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, no, 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 don't come near me. But no, his arms were so open. It's like, it's like when a hurting child comes and is embraced by a father or a mother and held, comforted, loved on. And that is the picture of our Heavenly Father when we come to Him in repentance. When we say, Lord, forgive me. He does. He's more apt to forgive you than you are for even asking. He's more anxious to forgive you, receive you, than you are of coming to Him. But when you do, whether, whether you've known the Lord and you've walked out, His open arms are saying, I'm still here. I'm still here. I still want you. I still love you. I still will accept you. I will forgive you. <clears throat> and you know, He wants us to do the same. He wants us to be the same. For as we have been accepted, as we have been forgiven, so is the will of God that we do the same for others. I mean, is there anybody in your life that you've got problems with and you're having problems with forgiving them? Anybody in your life that you just don't want to have anything to do with? And when they come around you, you try and turn your back, play like you didn't see them? Anybody like that in your life? You know, you need to get that thing right. According to the will of God, He said, you know, if you don't forgive, I'll treat you the way you treat others. You forgive, then I forgive. I mean, that's what he says. That's what Jesus said right after he was teaching the disciples how to pray. For when you stand praying, forgive one another, as <clears throat> even <clears throat> as your Heavenly Father forgives you. Forgiveness. So there is that forgiving kiss of compassion. If we don't have that compassion, Lord Jesus, put that in us. Put that in us. Holy Spirit, let it rise within us. Not just for this moment, but Father, when the moment comes, when we're able to touch that person some way, love on them, forgive them, even as you have loved and forgiven us. So this morning, how do we kiss God? How do we, how do we kiss the Lord, our Heavenly Father? I believe by letting the world know you love Him. By telling other people about Him. When we worshiped the Lord a moment ago, that was kissing the Lord. Loving on Him. And this song lends itself to actually saying that. I love And I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let me be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen. Go ahead and put that last slide up so that you see everybody sees who I outlined today. Today I believe one way just besides singing That we say, I love you, Lord. 
But as we leave today, loving on each other, telling somebody, hey, I love you. Because he said, as much as you do it unto the one of the least of these, you're doing it to me. Let's stand together. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in one. Holy Spirit, make us a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen. 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 Father, all these, may we never have a hip hypocritical kiss or an adulterous kiss but Lord may we enjoy the attributes of a merciful loving Heavenly Father and Father I thank you that we will appreciate and openly show that we 